Ashley. Hey guys. And so excited to have you here. All right, so we're gonna jump into it. I already um, told them that you're coming on, but I want you to give an introduction of yourself. Um, and we're just kind of have a fun conversation over the next, um, I don't know, 30 minutes to 45 minutes. But we definitely want you all to ask questions and interrupt us and um, just tell us anything you're curious about when it comes to us talking about food and mood, when it comes to somatic therapy um, and all of that good stuff. Yeah, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Ashley. Um, I work with women who have anxiety. Um, and instead of using kind of the talk therapy approach where you work on the thoughts in your head, I work on the sensations in your body. So I use a somatic and body-centered approach and kind of the main thing that I work on with my clients is helping them develop a foundational relationship to their body, really tune into the anxiety in their body so that they're able to move it through um, when they're done working with me. I love that. Thank you, Ashley. And we're going to be recording this and we're going to share it too. And so anyone that's watching this might not know who I am. I'm Gabrielle. I'm a registered dietitian. I love working with women on reducing anxiety through our diet because there's so much that comes from um, supporting your central nervous system, supporting uh, your blood sugar, all these things that impact your anxiety. And so I'm so excited to have this conversation with Ashley because it takes like the twofold, you know, the, the food we're eating, our lifestyle choices, but then also how we can release a lot of that built up stress, anxiety, um, and trauma in our body. And I will say that me myself personally struggled immensely with emotional stress eating. And so when it came to my personal healing journey, before I started working with clients, um, a big part of my like nutrition journey actually had a lot to do with managing my stress, anxiety, and all of that. Um, okay, Ashley, do we want to start off with doing a little, a little breath work? Yeah. So it's going to give you guys kind of a guided meditation, just since we're talking about the body. Um, I think it's important to really get grounded in the body. So we're present, we're grounded, um, all that good stuff. So I invite you guys to close your eyes if it feels comfortable to do so. And just begin to notice your breathing. Breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. in through your nose and out through your mouth and just begin to notice any sensations arise perhaps it's the first time you've checked in with your body today or in a while and that's okay And I always like to remind my clients, any sensations that come up are not good or bad, right or wrong. We're just getting curious with what's going on underneath the surface of your skin. Taking another deep inhale in through your nose. And breathing out through your mouth really allowing yourself to settle into whatever space you're in today. I invite you to imagine that your body is a garden. And it can be any kind of garden you want, but the garden is reflecting where the state of your body is at today. So I invite you to really get creative and really get a good snapshot of what this garden looks like. Perhaps it's full of lush, jungly plants. Maybe it's not, maybe there's some succulents. Notice if there's any flowers. Notice if there's any water features. And 
Notice if there's any birds or butterflies or little creatures. And just really breathing into your garden. Noticing every little detail. Noticing what you see in the garden. If there's anything you hear. Any smells. Anything that you feel like you could reach out and touch. And any taste in your mouth when you think about this garden. Taking a deep breath here in through your nose. Breathing out through your mouth or your nose. Whatever feels good for you. And noticing if there's any parts of your garden that need a little extra tending to. Noticing which areas of your garden's body are flourishing and thriving and getting attention. And noticing if there's any areas that need to be toiled or watered. And just breathing into those spaces that need to be noticed. That are wanting your attention today. Taking one last deep inhale in through your nose and a cleansing breath out through your mouth. And taking as much time as you need. When you're ready, I invite you to open your eyes and come back to our Zoom space. Yeah, so I like to do that at the beginning of every session I do because it really just helps get us grounded in our bodies. I think that felt amazing. Thank you so much. Okay, awesome. We're going to talk a little bit first about food and mood, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how, um, we're, what I was saying earlier with how stress and emotional eating can show up in our body, and Ashley's going to help us kind of work through that and what we can do to either prepare for it, what we do in the moment, and kind of also the aftermath. And then we're also going to talk about when stress, anxiety makes us have no appetite. Um, I, I know a lot of us can resonate, both of them can resonate with us. Some of us are more stressed emotional eaters. Some of us are more don't eat at all when we're stressed. Um, so we're going to talk about both sides and what we can do to, to work through it. So to first, I definitely want to talk a little bit about food and how it can impact our nervous center, our central nervous system, our mental health and our emotional health, because um, it has a massive impact on it. The first fun fact that I'd love to say is your 90% uh, of your serotonin, your happy hormone is actually produced in your gut. And so when our gut isn't flourishing and we do lots of gut health work in the program, but you know, that is eating a variety of fruits and veggies, eating enough protein, getting a good amount of fiber in, getting some probiotics in. Um, when we are nourishing that gut microbiome, we are supporting the production of our happy hormone. And so gut health in general, which is different for everybody, but some general tips and tricks is just eating enough throughout the day, getting a variety of color, because remembering that different colors yield different nutrients. So more color in the diet, the better eat the rainbow, um, getting good proteins, getting healthy fats. And so that could be salmon, avocado, that could be nuts. Um, all of these things are really foundational things to our gut. 
uh, also sleeping well and then managing our stressors that come into our day to day is going to help with your gut because your mind is connected to your gut. And so if we're really anxious and we're not sleeping well and we're not paying attention to our stress and anxiety, it's going to send those direct signals down to your gut, disrupting the microbiome uh, and making it more difficult for you to feel happy, sleep well. Uh, so it's kind of a, it's, it's a cycle because your gut impacts your mental health and your mental health in, impacts your gut health. Um, so gut health is so important. Blood sugar is also really important. If you are somebody who experiences blood sugar spikes and crashes, which a lot of us do, that can present in heightened anxiety. That can present in us feeling more anxious. Um, that can present in um, us having energy crashes, intense food cravings, gravitating to, towards more hyper palatable foods, because when your blood sugar spikes and then crashes, your body just wants quick, fast energy. What quick, fast energy is, is typically sugar, right? Because sugar is naturally the quickest way that you can eat food and have it converted to energy in your body. So you're, when you're having these crashes, you're going to gravitate towards the sugarier foods because uh, you're, you're just human and your body's like, give me quick energy. And so how do we support our blood sugar? Blood sugar is supported by not skipping meals and not, you know, skipping breakfast, not skipping lunch, not skipping dinner, having three solid balanced meals a day. Um, fasting as well is something I don't typically recommend. And that is because what happens when we wake up in the morning and we fast is our cortisol spikes. Um, when your cortisol spikes, your blood sugar crashes. So now not only do you have high cortisol and it's a fun fact because people will notice this as like, if you start fasting, people might report saying, oh, I felt really sharp in the morning. I feel really like good in the morning when I fast. The reason why you feel like that is because your cortisol is spiked. Cortisol, your stress hormone. When your stress hormone spikes, survival mode kicks in. And so you think back in the day when we had to run from like tigers or lions to survive, when we would see a tiger or a lion and our cortisol would spike, it makes us really um, it makes us really alert so that we can run away and survive. And then also your body releases blood sugar so that you have carbs and blood sugar to, to run off of so that you can again, survive. And so when we fast in the morning at first, it might feel for the first like few weeks or months when you're fasting, it might feel really good. And it's because you're releasing cortisol. The thing is, is over time when we continuously release cortisol and we're not managing the cortisol and bringing it down and managing our stressors and we're not eating, then you're going to have burnout. And that's when it really messes with your mental health, your endocrine system and your thyroid and your metabolism um, and makes you really low energy and will likely definitely also make any anxiety, depression, things like that worse. So eat breakfast, eat a really nutritious, balanced breakfast, eat all your meals if you can. Um, having a predictable routine with regular meal time, so like roughly around the same time for breakfast, lunch, and dinner can be really good for your nervous system and your blood sugar. Um, not under eating because under eating will release that cortisol and that same cycle will happen. Blood sugar also is really supportive if you eat protein at your meal first. So if it's possible, say you're having like salmon, rice, and asparagus, if you could eat some of the uh, salmon first, and that way when you go to eat the rice, it's not going to cause that blood sugar spike. Having no naked carbs is a fun one. So what I say is like dress up your carbs. So if you're having a carb as a snack or part of your meal, can we pair it with a protein and or a fat? Example would be like Cheez-Its with a yogurt. That's not a good combo, but you get the point. It's like some sort of carb. If you're having like an apple, can you pair it with like a cheese stick? If you're, because an apple is a carb. If you're having crackers, if you're having chips, if you're having toast, can we top that toast with like an avocado and an egg? Um, so dressing up your carbs is going to help with your blood sugar and it's going to help with your anxiety as well. Um, hitting your protein goals. I say at least 30 grams of protein per meal. Um, just being conscious of added sugar intake. So if we're having lots of like drinks, especially because drinks are so easy to we drink them fast, it'll cause that blood sugar spike. So um, getting drinks with either no added sugar or less added sugar can be beneficial. Um, breads, trying to go for like sourdough or sprouted, sprouted or whole grain bread instead of just white bread is going to help your blood sugar. Um, a fun fact is like getting a, if you're going out to eat and it's like pizza or, or a pasta place, can we get a little salad with a vinegar-based dressing? That's going to help prevent a blood sugar spike and crash from the pizza or pasta or whatever the carb, carb or heavy, carb heavier meal is. 
um, the acetic acid in the vinegar helps your blood sugar a ton. Um, skipping fruit juices and more so having whole fruit, so you're getting the fiber with the fruit as well. And then a little bit of movement post meal. That's going to help your blood sugar as well. And that's going to help with your anxiety as well. So there's blood sugar. And then there's also really important minerals that help with your anxiety because they help with your nervous system. One of them being magnesium. Um, so and this is to say, like, that's why it's not just important to care about your carbs, your protein and your fat intake. Let's make sure we're getting our minerals and our micronutrients just as much as we're getting these macronutrients and paying attention to those macros. Let's pay attention to the micros too. Um, minerals are so important. I call them like the spark plugs to your hormone health and a lot of your mental health and your gut health because in your heart health, everything. Um, but magnesium is one of the most important minerals for anxiety. And that is because it, it helps control the chemical messengers and neurotransmitters is what we call them to the brain, resulting in a calming effect to the body. And so you may have heard why people put like magnesium in their like sleepy cocktail drinks and what, you know, those, I forget what they're called, the I forget the trendy name for them, but um, they're putting magnesium in their drinks before bed to help with their sleep. Um, that's important to know that magnesium doesn't make you tired. It just allows for a calming effect um, throughout your day and throughout your night. So it's okay if you have magnesium in the morning, but magnesium could be found in like a supplemental powder, but it's also found in cooked spinach, cooked collard greens, avocado, um, dark chocolate has magnesium, black beans, bananas, green plantains, Greek yogurt, salmon, quinoa. Uh, so adding, making sure you're getting some forms of magnesium in food first is always best. And then you could also add a magnesium supplement as well. Um, cortisol, we, I talked weekly about that with the blood sugar, but we got to make sure that it's also a trendy topic out there that we want to lower cortisol. We don't want to lower cortisol. We want to lower what's triggering our cortisol to be released in our body. Um, so simple ways to do that is light exposure. So natural light and artificial light both spike our cortisol. So we don't, we want to wake up to light and we want to have light and, you know, trying to sit by windows when we're eating, um, when we're managing your anxiety, getting that natural sunlight. But at night, when we're trying to go to sleep, trying to stay away from artificial lighting, because that's going to spike your cortisol and that's going to disrupt your sleep. We all know when we don't sleep well, our anxiety is definitely going to be higher. Information overload is another big one for um, managing your cortisol is trying not to constantly be listening, reading, or, or uh, watching something every second of your day that spikes your cortisol. So I, I remember I read somewhere that if all of us, if, if the average person had on paper, everything they read, heard, or saw, it would fill up 34 truckloads of printer paper in words written out on the printer paper. That's how much we read, listen to, or hear on an average day because of our computers, our phones, our books, our work, our classes, our podcasts, our radio. It's just constant information overload. So trying to um, have moments, and Ashley can definitely speak to this, is like moments where we're just not doing any of that. And maybe we're doing like a seated meditation or we're just going on a walk and not listening to anything. And think, to, think to yourself, it's how often am, am I doing that? And then your daily routine and working on a morning routine, a bedtime routine, regular eating times, just so you have a little bit of rhythm in your day to support your cortisol as well. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's all top of mind of what I feel like is the most important parts of supporting your health, just eating enough, eating balanced meals, um, getting some good minerals in, supporting your cortisol and balancing your blood sugar is definitely, in my opinion, some of the most important things to help your anxiety uh, through food. Ashley, I'll hand it over. Anyone have questions about food and mood before we hop into Ashley's side of things? Then I'll hand it over to Ashley. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that makes me think that drink you were talking about, the magnesium, they 
moon milk used to be super trendy. Is that what you were talking about? Yes, yes. It, oh. There's a lot of different brands out there now. And they put, um, they basically put magnesium. Sometimes we'll put other things in like L-theanine or other herbs and roots that help with sleep. But um, the thing is, is a lot of us are deficient in magnesium. And so these like sleepy powders um, are, are beneficial in a lot of ways because of that magnesium. But we also want to make sure we're getting a lot of the magnesium through the food too. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious because I had a huge moon milk phase. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's funny. Um, so from my point of view and my kind of perspective on all of this, um, you know, why people fail with diets and restrictive eating kind of from a somatic perspective and Gabrielle touched on a lot of this already. So it's kind of me repeating some of this, but maybe from a little bit of a different lens to really help you ground it into your body. So you create safety in your nervous system by eating regular meals. Like Gabrielle said, your body is this like primitive caveman being still. So your body doesn't understand that like, oh, you just haven't had time to eat all day. And that there's a Trader Joe's five minutes away. Your body doesn't understand that like there's food nearby so if you're skipping meals regularly you're putting your body into a state where it feels unsafe right it doesn't know when it's going to get its next meal so by eating regular meals you're creating safety in your body and if you're creating safety in your body you're not going to feel as anxious um the other thing is yes blood sugar I will drive that home. If you are skipping meals, if you are not eating breakfast, you are setting yourself up to be anxious and cranky and moody for the rest of the day. If you take one thing, in my opinion, from this conversation, it's eating breakfast. It's getting up and making sure you have a high protein balanced breakfast um, or else your body is going to start emitting hormones that will put your nervous system into a fight or flight state. So if you already have anxiety and it's like daily anxiety, that would be my biggest takeaway is like prioritize that breakfast. If you prioritize any meal, I would prioritize the breakfast personally. Um, let's see. So, you know, a lot of people when they, you know, go to a meal plan or they start trying to improve their diet, it's really hard for them to pay attention to their hunger cues, right? A lot of us, especially in our American culture, we're so disassociated from our bodies. And so that what le is what leads to like overeating, undereating. So something that I like to do and that I used to do when I was personally struggling with this is before I eat a meal, rating my hunger, like on, one to, on a scale of one to 10. So one being like, I'm fucking starving and 10 being like, I'm about to throw up. I'm so full. Right. And so by assessing my hunger, being like, hmm, okay, well, like I'm at a three or four, I eat my meal. And then after I'm done eating my meal, I kind of reassess where I am on that scale. Be like, okay, well, now I've had, you know, these tacos or um, this chicken breast, and now I'm at a seven. And just that's really just helping you get into the practice of noticing what foods fill your body up. Um, because it's, you know, we're not taught to really do that. We're just kind of taught to like mindlessly be like, okay, that's a meal. But, you know, everyone's body is different. And so it's really important to notice your hunger cues. And a lot of that is like, it's like learning a new language um, or when you go weightlifting and you're building muscle. Um, these skills don't feel natural at first, but it's really, it's really kind of practice makes perfect, right? We make little efforts and they leave, they lead to big results. Um, and Ashley, I want to say something off of that. That yeah, is such a point that, um, it's something I feel like I don't stress enough when I'm working with clients is when you're done eating a meal and if you just don't assess at all, how satisfied you are from that meal. And then maybe an hour later you're hungry again. And you're like, why am I hungry again? I shouldn't, I shouldn't be eating again. I just ate a meal. Um, that's likely because whatever you ate just was not satisfying enough to you, but you don't know that because you weren't paying attention to how hungry you were before you ate, how satisfied you were after you ate. And so I highly recommend, and this is actually something I do myself too, is when you have a meal 
that you feel really satisfied from. And then say you have a really satisfying breakfast and then you're really not hungry again until lunch. And you're like, wow, like I never usually that satisfied from my meals, write that meal down. Like what was it in that meal that was so satisfying to you? Maybe it was the temperature, the taste, the flavor. Maybe it was the amount of fiber, the amount of protein. Everybody's different. So when you have these meals that are like, oh, that was, that was it for me, write it down and have that as a go-to meal. Same thing with lunch and dinner. On the other side of things, when you eat a meal and an hour later you're hungry, what did you have at that meal that maybe wasn't great for you? Maybe it was the taste, temperature, flavors, whatever it is, the components of it. Then you know that maybe you need to add something to that meal. Or maybe like for some people, a sweet breakfast, it makes them hungry and, and again an hour later because it didn't fully satisfy. They need that savory bit at breakfast to feel really satisfied from it. And so when you start noticing these patterns of like how you feel at, right after a meal, but also like an hour or two later, take note of it because that's going to help you develop that healthier relationship with hunger and your meals and your body, just like Ashley was saying. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, just really like everyone's, you know, everyone's body is different. What's going to satiate you might be different from someone else's. We all have certain things that we like, certain things that we don't like. Mm -hmm. um, and really building that somatic muscle is going to help us be able to discern that much more. Mm -hmm. um, so emotional eating, right? So binging. If you don't already know, I'm sure you probably do that typically happens when like you haven't eaten enough. And so that's your body's way of being like, okay, well, we need to find like the highest calorie, highest sugar, higher fat item, because I don't know when I'm going to get fed next. So again, driving home, so important to eat regular meals. Um, I pack snacks, like I'm a big snacker. So I'll pack like trail mix or turkey jerky or cheese sticks or, you know, whatever, in case I like run into a situation where I'm feeling hungry. I know that that's going to make me feel anxious. <laughs> And, you know, if there's several hours where I'm like out and about doing work stuff, I always kind of have like a backup snack. Um, let's see. So if you do binge, which again, super normal behavior, nothing to be, you know, ashamed about, like, I'm sure we've all binged at some point. That's definitely um, something I struggled with immensely in my journey as well. And sometimes once in a while, I still have an episode where I totally emotional stress eat. Um, you, I, I, that's another thing that's important to stress is like, we can never expect perfection from ourselves. Things are, we're still going to have vulnerable, vulnerable moments, moments we slip up, but, um, it, and it's very, it's a very common thing. I think, especially for women that we deal with these like emotional stress binge eating moments. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I used to, gosh, I used to binge back in like 2016, like a few times a week um, because I wasn't eating, you know, regular meals. Now it's, I probably binge about once every couple months. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as long as you're moving forward, even just 1%, you're making progress. Um, so I just want to remind you, if you're still binging, if you're still struggling with that, just focus on how you can improve just 1%. And that's a lot more manageable to your body in your nervous system too, right? If you're like, I need to stop binging just completely cold turkey, like that's going to create anxiety, right? And probably cause you to binge more. Um, so that's something I just wanted to bring to your attention. Now, if you have binged or when you do binge, I invite you to really just notice how it feels in your body afterwards. So let's, let's say you haven't eaten all day. You had a really shitty day at work. You come home and, you know, you eat a box of donuts or like, a bunch of chips or you make a bunch of peanut butter sandwiches and like eat them. That used to be my thing was peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> and I invite you to just really notice how your body feels afterwards. Um, there might be some conflicting emotions. You might feel satisfied because you, you did get calorie intake and you might feel some shame and just noticing how it feels. And then I really invite you to thank your body for working so hard to keep you alive. Because really what binging is, is your body being like taking care of you, right? Because like I said at the beginning, your body doesn't know that there's a Trader Joe's five minutes down the road. Um, if you're not eating regularly, your body's going to panic and thinks it's going to think it needs to get as many calories in um, to keep you alive and keep you safe. So I really invite you to do that because I know, especially as women, we can like shit on our bodies and have a lot of shame around 
our eating behaviors and our body image, but I really invite you to take a radical approach and really thank your body um, for the binging episode and just see how that kind of might shift things for you. Um, and then after that, I really invite you to take a moment and just ask your body, like, what does your body need in the next 24 hours to ground you back into safety? You know, so that can look like anything, right? So in, in my stuff, I don't give out like canned coping skills where I'm like, do this meditation practice or this breath work practice because everyone's different and like meditation doesn't work for everyone. Breath work doesn't work for everyone. Um, which brings me to <laughs> this nervous system regulation that I have clients make um, that you guys can make right now, actually. So I'll try to show you, but what I do is I break it into three columns. The first column um, says shut down from hunger cues. So that would be like, basically I'm ignoring my hunger. The second column is, is binging or emotional eating or overeating, however you wanna phrase it that relates to you in your life. And then the third column is calm and connected. So that's like, I'm listening to my hunger cues. I'm, you know, I'm not feeling, I, I'm doing all the right things. I'm feeling good in my body. I'm feeling good with like my relationship with food, et cetera. And so what you like, what I like to do is kind of write down, it's called a nervous system menu. Um, I like to write down like my coping skills for each of these things. So for shutdown from hunger cues, I like to find it's kind of when you're feeling disassociated from your body. So I like to find, ask the question, like, does it feel like it will bring a gentle return of energy? And that gentle return of energy will help you become kind of more aware in your body and will usually trigger hunger again. With binging, you wanna ask yourself, does this feel like it will help me discharge energy in a safe, organized way, right? Because when you are about to binge, you have a lot of energy and it's usually anxiety. And so it's like, how can I move that anxiety through my body and pick a different choice instead of binging? Because sometimes we do eat even when we're full because that's the emotional, we wanna numb, right? And so what choice can I make instead that still gives that same feeling of safety in my body? And then calm and connected. It's just, does this feel like it will help me savor and deepen a connected experience with food? But what I really want you to focus on is the shutdown from hunger cues and the binging. And remember, the really good thing about these menu are these are your coping skills. I'm not giving you like a meditation, a guided meditation to do or like a breath work thing. This is what's going to work for you. So for example, like for me, like binging my, on my nervous system, re system regulation menu, like cuddling with my rabbit, my pet rabbit is like my number one thing. If I've had a shitty day at work and I come in and I'm like, oh my God, I'm just, I'm going to go make a giant like sandwich. I'm going to like do all these things. I pause. I spend five minutes coloring with my rabbit while I'm thinking about what I'm going to make for dinner. And it just having that kind of pause before I just run into the kitchen has been so helpful for me personally. And again, if you're eating regular meals, hopefully you won't come home from work starving, but you know, no one's perfect and life is life, right? So it's nice to kind of have that menu as a backup. I love that. So like, so when it comes to like, you get this urge to binge emotional stress, eat, an easy way from this menu is to think like, what is going to, what can I do that's going to release energy in a safe, healthy way? Is that the right way to kind of think of it that yeah. you could do instead? Yeah. So, or first, that's how I always say is like, you know, it's not to say that you can't eat or you shouldn't eat. It's just like, what can I do first to kind of fill that void? So I love that, Ashley. So like, I was just writing some things that could potentially be ones for me that would be a discharge of, of energy in a safe way. Cuddling, absolutely. Whether it's a dog or a person or whatever is <laughs> mm -hmm. nearby. Um, a walk I wrote on mine, sometimes giving or releasing energy on a walk and maybe like listening to, to 
to music, um, laughing with a friend or family member, like maybe calling up somebody and just like having a good conversation where I'm exerting energy by laughing and connecting, um, just making a list. Anybody else have something that they would add to this list or Ashley, do you have any that you, that come to mind for examples? Yeah. I mean, the important thing is like, we're not reinventing the wheel. And a lot of these are like incredibly obvious. We try to like really complicate and come up with these like unique things to do, but really they're quite obvious things. Um, cuddling with my rabbit, going to the beach, um, watering my plants and noticing how the water goes into the soil, taking a sip of water and really allowing myself to notice how it goes down my throat into my body, putting my hands on my stomach and taking a few deep breaths. Mm -hmm. Um, those don't work for everyone. Mm-hmm. but you have I, to know what works for you. Yeah, definitely. It, it's, I think that's it's so important. Sometimes people will ask me like, what do I do in the moment when I'm about to stress or emotionally eat? And we can have options and we can brainstorm together, but it's going to be different for everybody. Um, and so I just wrote another one, which I feel like would be really good for me, which is like cleaning and organizing an area of the home. I feel like is so therapeutic to me. And that would be a good use of energy when I have that uh, anxious energy built up in my body. Yeah. And for some people that would like cause more anxiety, right? So it's, it's important to, you know, like discern what works for you. And as you deepen your connection to your body, it's going to become easier and more obvious to be like, okay, this is part of my nervous system, you know, regulation menu. Yes. Um, In terms of shutting down from hunger cues, right? That's a little bit trickier. So you're going to want to find things that really increase energy in your body. So for me, when I feel shut down, I like to turn on a hardcore rock song and like shake my body. And I look ridiculous, but I do it in private, right? Another thing I like to do is scream at the top of my lungs in my car. And it sounds really childish and silly, but I invite you to try it because a lot of adults haven't screamed since they were probably 10 years old, like really screamed right at the top of your lungs, like kids do on the playground. And we still need that. We still need that emotional release. Um, So those are some of mine. Mm. But when we're shut down and we're disassociated from our body, it can be really hard to remember to eat. Um, I remember in college, I was so, I stayed up all night doing this essay or whatever. I hadn't eaten in like a day and a half. Um, And I was so stressed. I tried eating a peanut butter and jelly and I immediately threw it up. Like I couldn't even keep food down. So that's almost like anxiety. It's almost like you're so anxious you can't even eat. So it's really trying to, where binging is like where I can put that energy when you're shut down. It's like how I can increase energy and kind of wake my body up and like remind it, my body that doesn't have to collapse. It can be open and your hunger will come back. Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah. And the screaming thing I love because I actually, my therapist that I'm working with right now has me um, on our sessions, has me like get a pillow and scream. We do like, we talk about whatever I'm like releasing, but then like, I'll scream about certain stuff and I'll literally hit my pillow. And he's like, I don't care that you sound like you feel like you're a child. You're supposed to, he's mm-hmm. like, I don't care if people think hear you from next door and think you look crazy. He's like, get a pillow. And he literally has me punch my pillow and yell and scream. And it has regulated my nervous system so much and it feels incredible. So I love that idea. The music too, Ashley, like you were saying, I think dancing can be a really good one for a lot of people. Again, something that we don't do anymore as adults. And there's, that's so sad because we should all be dancing. And so putting some good music on, if your kids are around, like having a little dance party with them, um, even just like shaking, like shaking your body, I bet would be great for some people. Um, Stretching. (laughs) stretching, you know, I'm just thinking of things that did get everyone else's brains thinking of like, what is that to you? Cause it's going to be different for everybody. But, um, I, I love all these ideas for bringing that gentle return of energy when you're feeling shut down, like you're saying, Ashley. Yeah, definitely. And we've obviously presented so much information to you guys in the past 40 minutes. And so in order to not create more anxiety for you, right. I would just pick one or two things to work on in the next week. So my question for for me would be like, what do you wanna do in the next seven days that support safety 
in your body regarding food or eating. It can be completing your nervous system regulation menu. It can be making sure you have breakfast just three or four days this week. Again, my whole philosophy is if you're moving forward 1%, you're moving forward. Um, and I never try to like overwhelm people with too much because then that typically leads to like the behaviors you don't want to do in the first place, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that's my stuff. That's my, that's my spiel. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Ashley. That's so helpful because there's so many layers. And I think as, especially as women, we beat ourselves up so easy of if we stress eat or if we forget meals because we're stressed, um, if we're constantly fe- feeling anxious, we just constantly blame ourselves and, and further dissociate from our body when we get into these mentalities, um, and, and feeling guilty and just shameful. And so, I know this is something for me when I was really, really struggling with stress, emotional eating, uh, I just would hate myself a little bit more every single time I did it. Mm -hmm. And I would become more and more dissociated from my body every single time I did it. And so even that simple takeaway that you were saying, actually, like after you have a binging episode or overeating, stress eating, emotional eating episode of just like, okay, how does my body feel right now? And then thank it for just trying to keep you alive because no matter who you are, what it, it, no matter what, what's showing up is, is survival and, or safety. Like your, your body is looking to survive or it's looking to keep you safe. So it's like, first of all, thank your body for that. And then that's where we can sit with ourselves a little bit and become more connected to our body of is like, what can I do to bring safety to my body? And how can I make my body not be in that fight or flight striving for survival mode um, yeah. that's and that's when you can access your menu after you have a binge like mm-hmm. look at your menu and find something that feels supportive to you that you can really bring into the next few days to help mm-hmm. prevent a next binge your um prevent another binge right mm-hmm. um and again like eating regular meals that's so important mm-hmm. yeah especially with all the trends out there right now with just like fast skits, fasting and skipping meals and Try not to fall oh, yeah. into the trap because um, it's going to, it might show re- quick result, which some people that's like, oh, I'm looking to lose weight or I'm looking to feel more sharp. And like I was saying, when your cortisol is spiking and you're fasting, you might lose weight at first. You might feel more sharp at first, but that's because your body is running off cortisol. And yeah. when you run off cortisol for a long period of time, everything comes crashing down. And so that's where we want to if you, if you haven't started that, don't, because we'll jump ahead of the game. If you were doing that in the past, have grace for your body and for yourself. And let's just try our best to start eating balanced meals. And if you're feeling like, oh, I'm really not hungry in the morning, just start small, have a little bit of carb, a little bit of protein, a little bit of fat and make your way up into a, a more satisfying, fulfilling meal. Yeah. With the intermittent fasting too, like, right. You're creating more anxiety in your body, which is probably going to lead into the behaviors that like made you gain weight in the first place, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's just not, it's not sustainable um, to like mildly starve yourself, in my opinion. No. Um, gosh, what was I going to say? It just slipped my mind. I guess it wasn't important enough. <laughs> um, one thing I do want to say too, is like it, it, all of this stuff is so important to become aware of and work on throughout the whole day, throughout the whole week, throughout your whole life, not just in the moment when you're experiencing stress, emotional eating or not eating. Um, and this is something I talk about in the program too, of like, what are we doing throughout our days to bring our body safety, to bring our body joy? Um, and besides with food, with the regular balanced meals, but actually something I always talk about, and maybe you can you have a word to say about this is um, doing things that bring us joy throughout our days, like incorporating dancing throughout our days, incorporating singing, if that's your thing, incorporating to like relaxation time and cuddling time, um, doing things more for the heart throughout your day and throughout your weeks so that you have less moments where your fight or flight takes over and feels like it controls you and your eating habits, just practicing more of that throughout your days in your life. Yeah, absolutely. So play is a very important part. We, we think of play as like kids on the playground playing tag and like playing games and you need that kind of energy as an adult too. Um, being in a state of play is actually being in the same state that you are 
when you're anxious, but you're, it's a feeling of safety. So you're actually training your body to like feel safe when you get into those states. So play is really, really good for people with anxiety. And that can look like anything. It can look like sitting on your couch and crocheting something that's creative to you. It can look like, um, let's see, I don't go running, but um, <laughs> it can look like running or going to yoga or being silly with your friends. Mm-hmm. Um, it can look like being creative and like redesigning. I like really like decor. And so like going and like thrifting decor, like to me, that's playful and fun. Mm-hmm. Um, the really fun part is you get to get curious about what, what you like and like what your body likes. Um, it's really a, it's a self exploration. Mm-hmm. So Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to be different for everybody. And um, that's just a, a way to start. And some people will say, I, I don't know what brings me joy. I don't know what's fun for me. And that's where, it, yeah, that's where it gets fun. And you, you get to get curious. You get to experiment. Yeah. You and try different things. things. <clears throat> Art therapy, music therapy. Sometimes we were just saying before you on the call, Ashley, that someone was playing uh, basketball. I think it was basketball this weekend. And it was so much fun. And I was like, yeah, I played pickleball and I had so much fun. It's like sometimes playing like a sport or something that again, we did more so when we were children, but we don't do as adults is what sparks that joy and play for you. Yeah. Especially if you struggle with like movement or like movement makes you feel anxious or scared because like, that's how I used to feel about it. Like finding movement and in, in play like if you enjoy pickleball and you find it fun or you enjoy some kind of sport or physical activity and you find it fun like yeah I go to dance classes like that's such an easy way to move your body where it's like I don't feel like I'm like checking off an adulting task I feel like I'm going to like play and have fun and do something yeah. fun for myself exactly awesome all right well does anybody have any questions for Ashley in regards to anxiety, stress eating, stress not eating, lack of appetite, um, somatic therapy, anything else? Well, thank you so much, Ashley, for coming on and sharing your wisdom. It was so lovely having you. Yeah, of course. Um, and if anyone yeah, how could people to... work for with you if they were? Yeah, in- yeah. So I'm actually offering kind of a beta program, not really, but I'm. I'm offering sessions right now for a discount. It's $55 a session. I do a four session package, which is really a foundational package that helps you build that initial relationship to your body. And then I offer a 12 session package, which really helps us dive deep into like, okay, like what areas of your life is anxiety stopping you from doing and how can we move the anxiety through? Um, so I'm offered two of those packages. A lot of my clients sign up for the four package initially, and then they extend. Um, but it's, it's a clean 55 bucks a session. Um, and I think Gabrielle has my contact info. So just reach out to her if you want to reach out to me. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Somatic Enchantment. You can also stalk me on there. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Awesome. Thank you, Ashley. Have an awesome rest of your day. We appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.